Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 75th anniversary of the Women's Armed Services Integration Act of 1948. Please stand for the arrival of the official party, the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin, Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen H. Hicks, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Michael P. Donnelly, Director of Administration and Management, and honored speakers, Vice Admiral Sarah Joyner, Director for Structure, Resources and Assessment, J-8 Joint Staff, and Major Shea Haver, Executive Officer to the Commanding General, United States Military, District of Washington. Please remain standing for the presentation of colors, the singing of our national anthem, followed by the invocation. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rockets red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still. Chaplain Colonel Karen L. Meeker, MedCon Chaplain, Office of the Surgeon General, United States Army, will lead us in the invocation. Please join me as I lift a prayer. Creator God, how much better is the U.S. Armed Forces with both halves of our population able to serve? For when you make a woman warrior, she is faithful and fearsome and forever resourceful. May the legions of ladies who have come before to protect the lamp of liberty without praise or pay like Harriet Tubman rest in peace in the glow of your glory. May those who now serve 75 years later wearing not only pants but ranger tabs and so much more 
May our service be strong and true, regardless of the obstacles that remain. Unite us in your kaleidoscope of creation, determined to give our lives to this noble enterprise called freedom. And in 75 years from now, may the world be more compassionate toward the disadvantaged, more determined against oppression, giving voice to the silent, full of sacrificial love to do justly, to extend mercy, and to walk humbly before you. I pray this to be so in your holy name. Amen. Be blessed, America. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The Honorable Michael B. Donnelly, Director of Administration and Management. Well, thank you all and good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this extraordinary celebration of the role of women in our armed forces. We're joined today by four veterans from the Armed Forces Retirement Home who lived the history that we are honoring today. Ms. Norma Rambo, who served for two years in the Marine Corps Women's Reserve at Camp Lejeune as a field cook and in the mess hall. And after World War II, Ms. Rambo graduated from college and went on to teach first and second grade for 27 years. She's had two children. She's had two children and lived most of her life in Michigan. Ms. Marion Marks, who spent her career as a member of the Women's Army Corps, the WACS. Her first nine years were as a cryptographer. Her remaining 12 years were as a dental hygienist. Ms. Marks began her career at Otis Air Force Base and was also stationed in England, at McCord Air Force Base and in Hawaii. After retiring, Ms. Marks lived in Rhode Island near her family. Ms. Marks. Ms. Corin Robinson served two years as a corpsman in the United States Naval Women's Reserve, the WAVES. Upon leaving the WAVES, Ms. Robinson married another Navy corpsman, and Ms. Robinson had three children and endured 19 moves with her husband's career, and they were married for 57 years. Ms. Marks. Ms. Hillary Rosado served in the Army as an imagery analyst and retired as a CW3. She was born in New Jersey, grew up in Scotland, and enlisted at a U.S. Air Force base in England. Ms. Rosado raised two daughters and has two grandchildren. Ms. Rosado. Each of these women stepped forward to serve our country in its time of need. And by doing so, they stood up to the skeptics, the doubters, and the naysayers. They made history. Thank you, ladies. America's history is full of stories about the acts of heroism and the sacrifices of men who offered their lives in service to our country. But alongside those brave men were brave women who also risked everything for the cause of freedom. In the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and in the First World War, women served 
but when the guns fell silent, women's service in wartime was all too often relegated back to the margins and written out of our nation's story. During the Second World War, approximately 350,000 women served in uniform overseas and at home as part of the greatest generation. After the war, American military leaders decided to write a new chapter. They realized that it would be impossible to secure the peace in a troubled world without the continued service of military women. And so in 1946, the Army requested that the Women's Army Corps be retained. After two years of debate on women's roles in the military, Congress agreed. And on June 12, 75 years ago, President Harry Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act of 1948. Today, we therefore commemorate this legislation and the permanent integration of women into the armed forces. This law was not the last chapter, but the beginning of many firsts that have made our military stronger and pushed our nation to realize its highest ideals and fulfill its fullest potential. One of those firsts has joined us this morning, and it is now my pleasure to introduce you to one of the first two women to ever graduate from the Army Ranger School, Major Shea Haber. Good morning, Chairman, my Army leadership, Secretary Austin, and the Honorable Hicks. Thank you so much for joining us today for this celebration. It is my honor to share this occasion with you in the celebration of 75 years since the Women's Armed Service Integration Act was passed by Congress in 1948. The act which granted women the right to serve as permanent and regular members of the Army Navy, Marine Corps, and the Air Force, representing a turning point for women's rights to defend our country. The history of women who have served in defense of our great nation is astounding. Even without the right to fully participate in our conflict, women have found a way to disguise themselves in men's clothing and cut their hair and do other really strange things that um, we don't exactly know why. Uh, but to, in order to participate in something much bigger than themselves. They stand shoulder to shoulder for top tier units like the fem female engagement teams in our war against terror. And they've found ways to continue to serve and give their lives in defense of our great nation, our people, our allies, and our ideals. We are all mostly aware of the iconic firsts, at least generationally, and know to recognize and congratulate them and those that have risen through the ranks and served with distinction. Although impressive and merited, of course, I would argue it is because of the er everyday heroine that we celebrate today. That each first represents the commitment, dedication, and everyday achievements of so many that came before and who persist after. At the Military Women's Memorial, just across the street over here at Arlington National Cemetery, you can read the personal stories and anecdotes of these women I like to call the in-betweens. They're the common everyday soldier, sailor, marine, and female airmen that make up the firsts, and they make us possible by their presence and their persistence, showing up every day to do the work and demonstrating the love that they have for their country, their teammates, and their duty that has made all the difference for the military women of today. I was 11 years old when 9-11 occurred, and I watched as the military family member how our military changed, the community around us changed, and the nation changed in response to those horrific events. My dad served in the Army for 24 years, and my mom supported his career and dedicated herself to the military community as well, setting an incredible example for my two siblings and me, especially in support of Gold Star families and the service members that were affected by the ultimate sacrifice of our fallen comrades 
and defense to our nation during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. These were our neighbors, our friends, and the family that we chose. That environment left a lasting impression on me about duty, honor, and the love of country. It lit a fire in my soul that I have continued with passion and perseverance to pursue throughout my lifetime and also my military career. I was just 12 years old when my father was deployed to Iraq uh, as an attack helicopter pilot when I asked my mom if women could have a career in the military. And she said, yes, of course, but what I really wanted to know was if women could fight and lead in battle. Neither of us knew at the time that there were women in between, just like Jessica Lynch and cultural support team members, redefining what women in combat could look like because of their courage, their service, their sacrifice, and for some, the ultimate sacrifice. I am honored to be able to stand here today with you. Along with the 75th anniversary of the Women's Armed Forces Integration Act, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the direct combat exclusion rule being lifted by Secretary Defense Leon Panetta in 2013. It has been a slow process opening all the military occupational specialties to female service members, and we don't quite have all of the roles and branches filled across the services yet. However, the significance is that women can, for the first time, should they be interested and qualified, volunteer to serve in any capacity. I am privileged, like some of you in this room today, to have grown up in an environment that has not constrained what I can and cannot do. I joined the Army at 17, and as a United States Military Academy cadet, I knew from the moment I stepped foot on those grounds that I was exactly where I was meant to be. And I was reminded every day of what I could hope to become. The Army has given me incredible opportunities to test my mettle and consistently push myself to improve individually and as a team member. I get it right some days, and other days I make mistakes. Nothing worth doing comes easy at first. It is persistence that makes all of us great. Although suffering for suffering's sake is not always the right answer, although I would probably assume for myself that it is sometimes the right answer, uh, persevering with passion for purpose's sake produces competence, confidence, consistency, and character that enables us to fight and win. I am proud to lead and serve in a profession that not only holds itself accountable, but me accountable to be able to come become all that I can be. As a woman, I have encountered challenges, but have not had to fight any harder than anyone else to get into the arena for which I have qualified. That is not to say that it has been easy, it's been hard work, but I have not had to fight for my right to suffrage or to be considered an equal person in the eyes of the law. Because I serve in the United States Army, I have not had to negotiate for equal pay, promotion, or recognition for my contributions to my organization. And I personally have not had to advocate on my own behalf as a woman for equity and inclusion because of the incredible mentors, leaders, friends that are mostly men that I've had the great fortune of serving with along the way. I am humbled that my experiences have been afforded me because of the many women and men that have gone before us and championed these causes. We owe a great debt of gratitude to those who laid the groundwork to ensure that it's no longer about closed doors, only closed minds, and we can do something about that. We are responsible for carrying the efforts forward into our spheres of influence at home, in our jobs, and in our communities every day. The truth is that there's still some work to be done to include women in the total force. And it's not enough to just open doors for women to walk through. We must invite them in and follow through with enabling and sustaining them. It will take humility, ownership, and accountability on both sides of the gender equation to shift our culture from seeing women as a nice to have to something that is a must have. Not every woman will be qualified or interested in every job. Quite frankly, the men aren't either. <laughs> but we are a profession that prides itself, not only on training and equipping ourselves to fight and win our nation's wars, but to also train and equip our allies and our partners with the tools that they need to succeed. So I think we have the skills. What about our will? Where one person's torch trickles out, another picks it up, their passion ignites it, and we collectively continue to press forward. And it takes more than just policy to shape the environment. We know that. It takes leadership. And every single one of us can and should be taking action to enable the female warfighter 
further. Our nation and our national security depend on it. So today, as we celebrate 75 years and recognize the continued commitment of this nation to support women's permanent contribution to this endeavor, the Department of Defense continues to set an example in the world by balancing this social and political issue, but really our primary mission of deterring war and protecting the security of the United States. The women and men who volunteer to serve this incredible mission and people are worthy of our support. It is they who will continue to carry the torch forward as we stay ready for any future conflict, crisis, or competition. Acknowledging that women have walked the tumultuous paths of firsts and experienced the isolation often of being an only along the way, women in between will ensure that that won't last. And that for anyone whose heart burns with the desire to do more, to do better, to be better, and to give their all, they belong here. With that, I am pleased to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is Vice Admiral Joyner, as the Director of Force Structure Resource and Assessment. A remarkable example, ma'am, of continued service and what, to what uh, continued service for our nation can look like, not just as a woman, but as a service member. Thank you. Honored guests, I am so pleased to be here today. Sec Mr. Secretary, secretaries, I see the Joint Chiefs, I see the men and women who serve in so many capacities. It's my honor, but mostly I stand on the shoulders of giants, one of which is only five feet tall, I've been led to believe. <laughs> so I truly am, am uh, shrinking as I go, but uh, certainly you are all are giants in my heart. And uh, I could not be here today without you being here and persevering through so many things. So thank you. Uh, every day I serve, I am so grateful to be here. It is the gratitude to be given the latitude to serve in every capacity. But I am going to take you back in time a little bit. I, I like sea stories, so we're going to do a few sea stories. And we're going to talk about what the path looked like, not to dwell on what didn't go so well in the beginning, but to show you where we are today and how fantastic things are and, and where we are and what we're able to do. When I entered the United States Naval Academy, the announcement had been made when I was 11 years old that I could go to the academy. And I turned to my father and I said, I'm going to go to the Naval Academy. He had two older sons. He said he started laughing, and that was it. I was in. I was going to go. <laughs> Best way. If, I think this should be our recruiting challenge is just tell people they can't do it and they're going to show up. Um, but uh, in, in when I entered in 1985, women were constrained to about 10% of the brigade or less. Uh, we had been challenged. We couldn't graduate 100 women. Uh, my class started with 135, and I don't think we broke 100 uh, when we graduated. Um, but many at that time thought that women not only couldn't fight, but shouldn't fight as well. So it was a combination platter, and if you went to the Naval Academy during that time, you were a second-class citizen because you could not serve in combat. Um, I went on a midshipman cruise, and I met a female helicopter pilot. And to be honest, I had never thought about flying. She was a rock star. Her last name was Donovan. Um, so she's a part of a, a good group of a Navy family that exists today. When I met her, I figured out women could fly. Um, I could only do non-combat roles. There were only limited squadrons I could go to. But someday, I wanted to fly a jet off of an aircraft carrier. So that was where it started. When I completed flight training, I had a limited number of places I could serve, but I was able to, to pick jets. I flew A-4s, went to the Philippines in 1991. And I served there as an aggressor pilot. I was one of two women in that squadron with very limited uh, enlisted as well, two women pilots. Uh, the, it was very clear from the beginning that not being able to serve in combat was going to be difficult. Um, my male counterparts, that's what they valued. They understood they wanted to, uh, to do that, and they understood that's really what service was about for them at that time. So it, it was a difficult time in that squadron as we went forward, though there were always supporters who helped out. Um, but what happened in 2000, 
1993, or 1993 was very remarkable, and it was the repeal of the combat exclusion law, and that changed everything. And that road, what, that was the segue in the, that came after our 75 years that we're celebrating today. And that allowed me to become an F-18 pilot and to serve more fully. And I was able to go, and I was behind my male counterparts. I had been in two VC squadrons, so I went to sea for five years, and I served. During this time, I also married my husband, and we both deployed different directions because he was a naval aviator as well. And I knew I was in the spotlight because there were so few of us. I was one of two female pilots in that squadron who became one pilot uh, at the time, and I knew that every time I did something, people were watching. There weren't very many. But persisted, and in 2007, coming forward, I became the CEO of a strike fighter squadron. Amazing, I was the CEO of the gunslingers. And with me, in every place within the organization were women. I had a female master chief, I had a female ma maintenance officer, I had female pilots, and I had female enlisted all through the ranks, female chiefs, and it was a completely different experience. Um, so when, while in command, I'll tell you a story of one night where I launched from the aircraft carrier. It was OIF, it was 2007, and it was a surge, and we were going to drive the bad guys out of Iraq. That was the idea. I went out, and what should have been sort of a quiet night, there wasn't a lot planned, but there was always something going on, it became a kinetic night as one of the convoys that we were looking out for came under fire. They hit an IED, and uh, unfortunately, there were casualties. As we got on the radio, my wingman and I, we were the last event of the night from the carrier, and we were talking to uh, a young soldier on the ground. I don't know if he was an air controller or not. He picked up the mic and started talking. He asked us to remain on station while they medevac their wounded. He said that there were, they could hear people out there, they could hear gunfire, and they asked us to stay overhead. We went into mission extension mode. So you start managing your gas, people start trying to help you, um, the CRC starts vectoring all sorts of help your way, they tr start sending tankers your way, and some of those tankers, they had men's voices and some had women's voices. Those CRC operators, some were men and some were women, and it didn't matter. So as we uh, went, we were doing a daisy chain, we were going to the tanker, they were pushing gas to us, we stayed overhead, they were able to medevac out their wounded, and they were able to safely exfil out of the area and, and go back, and they, they were able to not come under any other fire or take any other casualties. My wingman and I, knowing that we were a couple hours past our recovery time, flew back as fast as we could, all the way in afterburner, and uh, came in and uh, landed, and the entire flight deck was silent when we shut down because everybody else had returned hours beforehand. Got out of the jets, and everybody's like, where have you been? And, uh, and we started telling the story, and you could just see the faces on the sailors as they realized that they were part of taking care of people. They were part of that mission. They were part of making sure that people on the ground stayed safe. They were sh part of the mission that was going on forward in, in Iraq at the time. And what I will tell you is, it's a shared mission, it's a shared story, it was men and women, and nobody cared what your voice sounded like, what you looked like. All they wanted for you to do was to do your mission. So that's the story I'd like to bring forward today. That's where we are today. Nobody cares what you look like, just do the mission and do it well. So today I'm surrounded by men and women in uniform. They fill every role. Army Ranger here today to join us. Um, it's pretty amazing situation that we see is we're able to serve in every capacity. My husband and I both served. We served together and he retired after 25 years of service. And we were able to balance out and have two wonderful children. He took care of my kids two different times while I was on deployment by himself and I took care of the kids when he was on deployment. So, and we both agree that it's easier to be the person who goes than the person who stays. <laughs> that tells you something. So, um, my children know what it is to serve, and my daughter is, is serving. She's entering into service as well. So that's what you bring forward. You bring 
that love of service, that understanding that there's something greater than yourself. And there are men and women today that are serving with distinction, and I am so proud to be part of their ranks. So as I look at today, today is a celebration. It's a celebration of what you all made possible. It's a celebration of what continues today and what has continued to open doors for women throughout the world. I think we are an exemplar, and you made that possible. So as we talk about uh, great and uh, capable women, I have to turn, and I have the distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our Deputy Secretary of Defense. She is our 35th Deputy Secretary of Defense and just happens to be our first woman Secretary of Defense, our Deputy Secretary of Defense. So it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Kathleen Hicks and Madam Secretary, your floor. Well, let me uh, thank Vice Admiral Joyner for the very kind introduction and good morning, everyone. Secretary Austin, thank you in particular for the time that you're taking out of your busy schedule to join this important occasion. And I want to also acknowledge, as my colleagues have done, Ms. Rambo, Ms. Marks, Ms. Robinson, Ms. Rosado, welcome to the Pentagon and thank you for your service. Let me also acknowledge Admiral Franchetti and the many service leadership uh, members that are here today, Secretary of the Army, uh, Wormuth as well, and Congresswoman Nancy Mays, thank you uh, for joining us. What an absolute pleasure it has been to listen to both Admiral Joyner and Major Haver. Um, your words are inspiring, your careers are inspiring. Since Major Haver graduated from Ranger School, 116 more women have successfully soared through the glass ceiling that she helped shatter. And today, six female students are currently in training. And Admiral Joyner, you are nothing short of inspirational as well. The first woman to command U.S. Navy Strike Fighter Squadron and the first female commander of a carrier air wing. It's no wonder your call sign is clutch. <laughs> Even so, it's still too early to opine upon either of your legacies as your careers continue. This anniversary serves as a timely opportunity to celebrate the tremendous talent, tenacity, and expertise that women have long contributed to DOD's mission since the nation's first war. Unlike then, today, women are able to serve in the military regardless of their race or identity or their station in life. They can serve in combat roles, they can become Army Rangers, fighter pilots, and four-star generals. And the list goes on. Women in uniform continue to make history every day, taking on roles and responsibilities that were not before possible or attainable. Progress, like the progress we're celebrating today, is not inevitable. In fact, it is often met with skepticism and outright resistance. For decades, critics have openly argued that our differences could be our downfall. They question, with women in the ranks, can the U.S. military maintain the connection, camaraderie, and community that are among its hallmarks and greatest strengths? I don't think anyone today would seriously question the dominance of today's U.S. military, the finest fighting force that the world has ever seen. The full integration of women into our armed forces has only made our military stronger and our nation safer and more secure. And in addition to that, it moved the entire nation closer to the promise of full equality, reinforced the power of unity around our shared values, and underscored that we, as a nation, are more effective when we draw on the talents of qualified Americans willing to serve. I come from a military family, men and women, who have proudly served this nation. In fact, back in 1975, my father served as the action officer for the admittance of women to the Naval Academy. So you're welcome, Clutch. <laughs> back in 1976, 81 women trailblazers entered the Naval Academy for the first time. 55 women graduated from that class. When Secretary Austin, 
delivered commencement remarks to this year's graduating Naval Academy class, there were 267 women graduated. So we should be proud of the progress that the Department has made to maintain a U.S. military that reflects the nation that it is called to defend. It is historic and we rightfully celebrate it. Yet as we do, we acknowledge that our work is not done. It is our responsibility to break down even more barriers for all of us and for the generations to come. I, for one, am very proud to help lead a department that continues to expand opportunities to women, one that is com committed to advancing gender equity and equality, and one that acknowledges that the service and sacrifice of all those who serve this nation are to be honored. So I thank each and every one of you for coming to celebrate this occasion with us today. And it is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. There's more. <laughs> Secretary Austin, throughout your, your very brief 41 year career serving in the U.S. Army. Secretary Austin distinguished himself as a brave warfighter, sharp strategist, and empathetic leader. Over the past two years, as our 28th Secretary of Defense, he has doubled down on that legacy. He has deepened our partnerships with and, and alliances throughout the world, tackled tough security challenges, and ensured that DOD is prepared to defend the nation now and far into the future. Mr. Secretary, the floor is yours. Wow. Well, good morning. Let's, let's hear it again for our outstanding Deputy Secretary. And Kath, it truly is an honor to serve alongside you, so we appreciate everything that you continue to do for this department. Shay, I have to admit, I was surprised to see you wearing glasses. Don't feel so bad now because I have to wear glasses. But see, there is this superwoman rumor floating around, and I couldn't figure out if those were Clark Kent type glasses or. <laughs> and Admiral Joyner, uh, I, if I took a vote right now, I think everybody in the room would say, "We don't want to hear the secretary. We want to hear more war stories." So <laughs> that's a pretty good war story. I couldn't figure out whether or not the person that you were trying to protect was uh, the people that you were trying to protect were me and a chairman because we we did get blown up one night and in, uh, in uh, Baghdad together but uh, I think the times don't match but uh, that's quite a story and 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 thanks for all to all of you for being who you are and for what you do for our military let me also thank uh, congresswoman mace for being here and also uh, senior leaders at the department of defense who've joined us today and again, a solid word of thanks to uh, Major Haver and Vice Admiral Joyner for what they've done to blaze uh, new trails for women service members. And so today we celebrate 75 years since President Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act. And of course, as uh, Mike said earlier, women have always stepped up to defend our country. In our Revolutionary War, women operated behind enemy lines as spies. In the Civil War, some 3,000 women served as nurses for the Union Army. And during World War I, women were translators and accountants as they operated switchboards, and, and they operated switchboards. And by World War II, women were driving trucks and rigging parachutes. And they were serving in the Marine Corps like Norma Rambo, whom you just met. And women began cracking code as cryptographers like Marion Marquez, as you also met earlier. And they paved the way for more women who were joining us today like Corinne Robinson, who served in the Navy, and Hilary Rosado, who also served as an imagery analyst for the, for the Army. Let's uh, thank all of these great Americans for their service once again. Applause 
and I have it on good accord uh, uh, that uh, you are going to reach uh, the ripe age of uh, the young age of 100 here in September, uh, Ms. Rambo. Is that do I have that correct? <laughs> God bless you. Now, after World War II, our top military leaders finally endorsed making American women full and permanent members of the armed forces. But getting that through Congress wasn't easy. At one hearing, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee questioned why women should serve in our military on the same basis as men. And the first witness to respond was General Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he said simply, we need them. We need them. The United States military needs women. Our military is the best fighting force in human history. And to keep it that way, we need the best war fighters in every domain of potential conflict. And the only way to make that happen is by drawing on the talents of all of our people, and not just men, who happen to represent less than half of the U.S. population. And in return, we, we must create a military where American women can contribute the full range of their skills and strength, and where they can take advantage of all that a career in a U.S. military has to offer, like being a part of something bigger than yourself, and defending the values of freedom and democracy, and making a difference, and growing as experts and as leaders. We owe it to American women to get rid of bias and to wipe out the cancer of harassment and sexual assault in our ranks. We owe it to them to make a military career compatible with raising a family for both mothers and fathers. And we owe it to them to break every barrier in the way of their service. This is a priority for the Department of Defense. And I'm so proud to have you all as teammates to get it done. You know, back in 1948, one of the main supporters of the women's integration legislation was Colonel Mary Halloran. And I love telling the story of what happened when she enlisted. You see, Colonel Halloran was just five feet tall. And the recruiter asked her what the Army could do with someone so short. And she replied, you don't have to be six feet tall to have a brain that works. <laughs> and she became a colonel and a director of the Army, the Women's, Army's Corps, Women's Army Corps. Now, as women's service members waited for Congress to act, many got frustrated and considered leaving the military. But Colonel Halloran encouraged them to stay on. In an open letter, she reminded them of the hurdles that women had already achieved, had already cleared. They'd already proven their value in wartime and in peacetime. And she said, those who bet against you lost. And ladies and gentlemen, 75 years ago, American women won again. And America won yet again. We've now had three women lead combatant commands, including General Richardson at Southcom, and General Van Ovost at Transcom. We've had distinguished women, uh, four-star uh, officers in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. And Command Sergeant Major Veronica Knapp recently served as a senior enlisted leader of the 101st Airborne Division. And three years ago, Joanne Bass became the first woman to serve as Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Women's service has made our military stronger. And that's worth celebrating today. And it is yet another spur to drive us all to make even more progress as we go forward together. So let's renew our resolve to make our military even stronger, more capable, and more just. For all the brave patriots who raise their hand to serve our great country, and I am truly honored to be here with all of you, and I'm proud of what our women contribute to this great country. 
May God bless you, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pershing Zone United States Army Band Vocal Ensemble will perform Making History. Each of us helped when the battle was down to the wire. And all of the women and men who came through under fire. And maybe not one of us saved the day, but maybe together we all did. When the call got through, when the hill was taken, when the tide was turned and the world was shaken, could it be we all are making history every moment? Could it be we each have a role to play? Could the hardships we go through and the smallest things we do be making history? Every day, every choice we make, we're making, shaping and molding it slowly, unfolding it onward, stumbling, faltering, steadily altering all that came before, tearing down to build once more. Because history is affected by how we've intersected, by a million dreams connected, part of one whole. Every person here is making history, making history. We all have a share. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the departure of the official party. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to come forward and meet today's VIPs from the Armed Forces Retirement Home along with Major Haver sitting in the front row seats. Again, thank you for attending today's event and enjoy the rest of your day.